your Bibles this morning to the book of John. <clears throat> people, we were on vacation last week, and uh, people asked me, oh, well, how you doing? And I go, I'm doing great, but now I need a vacation for my vacation. <laughs> you ever gone on vacations like that? We, were, we went down to the south. We were, uh, did we go to Georgia? No, we didn't go to Georgia. But we went to Mississippi, we went, we went to New Orleans. That's quite a town. Like I said, I, I don't mind visiting, but I don't want to live there, okay? But it was interesting. And uh, we went to Louisiana, and uh, where else did we go? Alabama, yeah, is that it? Just Tennessee, yeah, we went to Tennessee, yeah. Yeah, we went to Arkansas. I can't, my brain has gone dead on me up here. We were in uh, a town Elvis Presley loved, but we didn't get to Tupelo. That's where he was born. But uh, yeah, we, we went by Sun Records. You, you ever heard of Sun Records? It's about eight by eight. <laughs> I'm serious. It's a little dinky place. And... Uh, Johnny Cash started there. Roy Orbison started there. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis started there. And uh, the young people are going, who are those old people? I never heard of them. <laughs> and of course, Elvis Presley started there. But it was, it, it's, it's an interesting experience. Um, you have your Bibles? Open them, open them up to the book of John. find in the Bible is we find principles for living. And uh, I, I pointed out yesterday, I don't know if I can remember exactly. Uh, I, think, I think I can find it. Yeah, it, it, in, in Ephesians it talks, and I'm, I won't go there, but in Ephesians it talks about not giving place to the devil. And when we do give place to the devil in any, any way, shape, or form, he never stops, he increases. He demands more and more and more and more and more until your life is a wreck. And, and I... I brought this point up yesterday in the school of prayer. I've been in the ministry about 50 years, and I, I've seen people absolutely on fire for God, moving for God. Many of them called of God. And then all of a sudden, I see something happen in their lives, and they fall off of the, of the wagon, so to speak. And, and I... I used to wonder all the time. I would say, why? What, why? What, what made them do that? And I've been in the ministry officially 50 years, so I've seen a lot of people come and go. And, and I was sitting there, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said they gave place to the devil. They allowed the devil to come in and take ownership of some area of their life and that was the beginning of the end. And, and you know, I used to wonder, we would, I, I would see in the Word, and I read this, it said, like, don't let the sun set on your wrath. And I would say, but how often, as believers, we let the sun set on our wrath? And, and put away lying and stealing and cheating and et cetera and et cetera, and yet, I see believers a lot of times letting that stuff creep back into their lives. And I thought, why? And again, the, the Lord said, they gave place to the enemy. They opened a door. And when you open a door to the evil one, he comes in 
like rolling thunder. I mean, he, he wants ownership of your life. And so, so how do we countermand that? How, how do we stop that from happening? We all struggle. We all have failures. We, we all goof up. My message this morning, I entitled it, Benefits of Communi- Communing with God. That's the key. We have to commune with God. I used this scripture not too long ago, but I want to use it again because it's the key. You find it in the book of John. You find it in the 15th chapter. It's so familiar to us, and yet we all have a tendency to neglect it. John 15, verses 1 through 8. Let me read it for you. I am the vine. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. So Jesus is the vine. And his father owns the vineyard. His father's in control. What Je- if you want to sum up Jesus, you could say he came to do the will of the father. And if we're created in the image of the father, and in a sense Jesus being God, we're created in his image also, then that should be our purpose and mission. Our, our, every church's mission, that they'll think up a, a, a fancy title or this is our mission. Every church's mission should be to fulfill the purpose and mission of Christ, which was ultimately to please the Father. That should be our mission, to please God. To do what he would want us to do. So, so right away, he lays down the ground rules. He says, I am the vine. You're not the vine, I'm the vine. This is my word. It will not return void. So be obedient to it, obey it, and you'll experience success. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So, so what, what we see here, he wants us to be beneficial disciples. He wants to, us to be productive disciples. And I've said this a thousand times, don't look to your neighbor, don't look around, you're it. You're all Jesus has. Whether you like it or not, you're all that the Lord has. And he very clearly says that as he's the light of the world, we're the light of the world. The world is looking for light. The world doesn't have to be convinced that it needs light. It knows what it needs. You know, I mean, the life of a Hollywood star is short-lived. It doesn't last very long. Age has no place in our society today, if you haven't figured that out. You know, they're taking Jay Leno off. What do you think they're taking Jay Leno off? Because his demographics don't appeal to that 35 and under age group. So he's history. And, and his successor, his little skits go viral on the internet. So guess what NBC's going to do? He's gone. But, but that's the philosophy of the world. Don't be surprised. But really, the philosophy of the word is the opposite. It says that the white hairs are a crown of glory, that there's something of value in aged people. They, they can teach you something, young people. They can instruct you. They can help you. But let me go on here. And so if you're a branch that refuses to be a beneficial disciple, there he has no need of it. So then what you see happening is that they fall off. They backslide. They go their own way. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. We do that every, every spring. We trim all of our trees our bushes, our roses. Why? So that they will bud more. They will, they will, they will uh, produce more. So it's not a bad thing to be pruned. 
He prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. That's the key. Every, every passage of Scripture, there'll be a, a key that will jump out to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. And I pointed this out yesterday. Why, when we get into deep trouble, do we not turn? The first person we should turn to is the Lord and His Word. But we, we have a tendency, we'll, we'll go to the biggest loser in our life and ask their advice. And, and I have a saying, I have little Philippisms. And, and it doesn't sound good, and people are probably going to get upset, but you want to be a loser? And I don't see one hand going up. But I'll, I'll tell you the, how to be a loser. Hang out with losers. They'll make you a loser. A loser will make you a loser. You're predestined to become a loser. All you got to do is size up their life, look at them, and go, wow, I want to be just like them. So I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to ask them for advice. I'm going to do what they tell me to do. Guaranteed, you will not be a success. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the true vine. You are the branches. That's the order. We don't control him. He controls us. If you detach yourself from, from the vine, you're gone. You're dead. It's over. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. What does that connote? It's relational. It's a relationship. Without maintaining an ongoing relationship with the Lord, you will make it. And, and if, if you... I can, I can guarantee this. If... Who are we talking about this morning and you said uh, yesterday... Who? Yeah, Jane Seymour. Remember she was the doctor? She's been married four times and she's filed for divorce again. I mean, do you see a pattern here? When you detach yourself from Jesus, when you detach yourself from the vine, it's going to affect every relationship in your life. Once you fall away, your marriage will be shaken to the foundation. Now, if you're saying, well, I'm ready to pack up my bags and move to another house and repeat the same thing that I repeated three times before, okay, good luck. But remember, Jesus said, the very word said that when you go back to the slop, when you go back to the garbage, when you go back to the vomit, you're seven times worse than you were before you ever left it. So you think you were a bad drug addict before? Oh, man, you, you haven't experienced anything. Got to finish the, the passage here. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, a lot of times people say, well, man, you know, I want this and this and this and this and this. He's going he's gonna to meet your needs. You may not meet all your wants. Because I, I know myself, if I had everything I wanted, I would no longer be dependent on Jesus. I wouldn't need him. I used to complain because we inherited a bankrupt business one time and Charlene and I literally turned that thing around and it became super productive. It made us a lot of money. 
But when I took it when it was bankrupt, I used to complain every week, why do I have to pray in the payroll every week? God, just send it. Well, if he would have done that, if he would have sent the year's payroll, I wouldn't have prayed every week. I'm just being honest with you. And you know what? Most people wouldn't. I mean, if we didn't have needs, we wouldn't be dependent on the Lord. Needs make us dependent. Things that happen to us causes our attention to be turned to the Lord who can meet the needs of our needs. <laughs> it may sound redundant, but it's true. And so it's not a bad thing to be dependent. It's not a bad thing to be into communication. That'd be like you being married or having a girlfriend or real good friends and saying, I'm never going to speak to them. I'm never going to talk to them. I'm never going to have interfacing relationship. I'm not going to communicate. They just got to know that I love them. They just got to know that I care. They're not going to know that. If you, guys, if you don't open the door for your wife, I mean, what does opening the door for your wife mean? It means you care. It means the spark is still there. It means the zip is still there. If you, you don't remember Valentine's Day and birthdays and Christmas and all that, Pretty soon she's going to say, how do I know this guy cares for me? And that's sometimes the way we, we treat Jesus. Well, Jesus, you know I love you. He does. I, I like Rod Stewart. I, I, was, I found the music to Have I Told You Lately That I Love You. I like that song. Remember that song you sang? I sang that here for a, a program that Sharning put on one year, and I sang it to a pig. Marge, you remember when you dressed up like that little pig? And we set her up here and I sit and I sing, Have I told you lately that I love you? Miss Piggy. I, I'm, give, I'm telling you, say, what does this have to do with the benefits of communing with God? That is communing with God. Telling God that you love him, telling Jesus, I love you, Jesus. Well, I told him when I first got saved, I told him five years ago, tell him every day. Every day, tell him. Who, who, who wrecked their car so bad? I can't even remember who it was now. Who? Somebody was telling us that they tore their car up. Oh, yeah, one of, one of the little waitresses serves us. She's a real nice girl. And she was on her way home from work a couple of days ago. She lives in Fontana. She was on the 10 freeway. And this girl was in the fast lane, and this girl kept cutting in and out and in and out of the fast lane. And so the girl that was in the fast lane abiding by the law honked at her and basically told her, don't do that. And the girl literally went over and hit her and knocked her spinning, and she came out of the fast lane, and she hit Liz's car, and Liz's car went all over the freeway, and a semi-truck that didn't have its truck ran into her, ran into Liz, tore her car completely to pieces, and she, I couldn't believe the, the like, rope burns you get from seat belts. I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, but she was burned. I said, how, how far? And she said, clear down to here. Beat up and bruised all over. Car destroyed, tore up. But, but I think to myself, every one of us could say, yeah, I've had close calls like that. When's the last time we said to Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for traveling mercies. Thank you, Lord, for saving my life. Thank you, Father. I mean, you know, 
I've had two open heart surgeries, and when you're going through them, boy, are you close to God. <laughs> oh, man, you, you can't tell Jesus enough that you love him. And be with me, and protect me, and guide me, and give knowledge to the doctors. And we, oh, man, we know all that kind of stuff. It's been a year now. I'm glad I made it, but you know what? I can't remember the last time I said to Jesus, thank you, Lord, for getting me through heart surgery again. And, and I feel bad for Sharni. Sharni said, we got to walk today. I don't want to walk. I'm sick of walking. I don't want to walk. It's too cold. It's too hot. I ought to be thanking God that it can walk. You understand what I'm trying to say? See, we, we start taking things for granted. We start taking each other for granted. We start taking relationships, friendships, husbands, wives. I wish, I, you know, I took my mom for granted. I wish I had my mom back. I mean, I'll see her again, but only God knows when. So, so I'm using all these crazy illustrations to try to get you and convince you that we ought to be doing that with Jesus above all. We ought to be communing with Jesus. I mean, we'll tell some guy or some girl that, you know, oh, I love you with all my heart. I, you know, I couldn't live without you. That was 22 girlfriends ago and 22 boyfriends ago. Remember that? Remember those days back in those, those days? But we ought to be telling Jesus that every day and meaning it. You know, prayer is, it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. But prayer is more than asking or seeking or knocking. And that's what the, the Word tells us that. Ask, seek, knock. Prayer is a moment by moment communication with God. That's why we pray. And even in our prayer life, you know, I try to convince you, church, not to go into a prayer closet with a preconceived list. We, we enter our prayer closet as if we were sitting on Santa Claus's knee. Remember, remember those days when you, you believed in Santa Claus and, you know, and our little ones still do, so I better be careful here. So, so we would go sit on Santa Claus's knee and you would... And I want this, and I want this, and this, and this, and this. Sometimes when we go into prayer, that's the way we treat Jesus, as if, as if he was Santa Claus. And I want a T-Bird, and I want a Harley Davidson, and I want a... I'm not saying God can't give you one. I mean, I'm looking at a 73 Mercedes-Benz Coupe right now. And I'm praying real hard that God can convince my wife that I need that. <laughs> now, I convinced her of a 51 Merc, so I'm sure I can convince her of a 73 Mercedes-Benz Coupe. And she said, well, I like that car. She said, well, I, I know, but I'd have to restore it. So what have we learned so far? And I don't want to belabor this. We've learned that all believers, all believers, you, 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 and me, have to abide in Jesus. No exceptions, no excuses. And if you don't, believe me, we will give place to the devil. And when he comes in, we're in big trouble. And if we're in big trouble, our business is in big trouble. Because when you give place to the devil, the next thing you do, you say, well, how could my business be in trouble? Talk to any tax man. Well, you know... Uh, are you sure you didn't give this much? Well, you know what? I might have. On second thought, I might have given that much. Knowing good and well, you didn't give that much. There's a lot of ways to cheat and a lot of ways to lie. When the devil comes in, it will affect your business. It will affect relationships. It will affect your marriage. It will affect your children. It will affect everything. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, I'm being foolish here. I saw that 
Mercedes, I talked to the guy, I know how much he wants for it, I know what has to be done to it, but I'd be a fool to buy that car. Because something inside of me says, don't touch that car with a 10-foot pole. Well, how, how did you accomplish that? By communicating with Jesus, believe it or not. His spirit goes, that ain't the car for you, that's a money pit. So it's vital for the branch to stay connected to the vine. That's what he's saying here. The vine is the life of the branch. Christ desires that every believer draw life from himself. And to accomplish this, believers must maintain close communion with their Lord. So, so we ought to get, is this a good word? I don't know, hotter for Jesus? We shouldn't cool off. I mean, the church used to, used to say this to me. <clears throat> oh, get people that have been saved three years or less because they're on fire for God. And they'll go out and work for you. <clears throat> That's a sad commentary. That after three years old, <clears throat> we ain't hot for Jesus anymore. We forgot the open heart surgery. We've, got, we've forgotten the car wrecks that he saved our lives from. I like James. I like James 1.6. All believers, now this is kind of a silly thing. All believers must believe. <clears throat> well, they must. <laughs> All believers must believe. But let him ask in faith and not doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You get tossed to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. How do you avoid that? Ask with positive faith. And never, and never be set in your ways. That, that, that's a death knell. If, if you ask God for something and you know in your spirit he's telling you, ain't going to give it to you. Anything more than saying, I accept that as your purpose and will for my life and I'm going to move on and accept what you have for me, we end up acting like the little kid at the cash register. Yelling, screaming, hollering, kicking, laying in the floor. <clears throat> it's mine, it's mine. Like I did it the other day. I, lo I love Warner Brothers cartoons. Love them. They make great emphasis for biblical principles. Daffy Duck, it's mine, it's mine. That's what we sound like. Can you imagine? We laugh at this silly stuff, and we're just as guilty. I'll tell you another one, Christians. What does Daffy say? Nobody tells this little black duck what to do. I know a lot of Christians that act that way. Nobody. It's mine. It's mine. Ask with positive faith. Expect an answer. Faith bears fruit. And finally, I'm going to close with this. All believers must know the three levels of faith. Note the variations. And you're going to go through this. And you've got to work on it. And you've got to build it. The Bible says that Christians can have little faith. I've been there. That's why we pray for one another. Pray you one for another. When you're so sick, like, like Maria's father right now, Eddie. Eddie's really gone through it. Had open heart surgery, put a valve in, the valve got infected. A year later, they had to take, open him up again, take the valve out, and put another valve in. And then his pancreas went out, so they had to open him up and take the pancreas out. Then they said, well, he's got an abscess. I, I can guarantee you, Almost verbatim, and, I, 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 and I'm not there at his bedside. These are his words. I want to die. I just want to die. 
Well, what, what do you do about a deal like that? We pray for him. If we're willing to, we pray for him. This is not wasted, you know, effort. When you get a, when you get a prayer request, and on the internet she said, Eddie's doing better. He's feeling better. And I'll guarantee you, if he starts feeling better and better and better, and we continue to pray, that within another three or four days, he's going to say, I don't want to die. And thank you, Jesus, for sparing my life. So, so when we look at this and we go, oh, isn't that an awful little faith? We all experience times of little faith. when we're going through deep water. And then there's mustard seed faith. That's the beginning levels of faith. If you have faith as a mustard seed. But what people don't realize, that mustard, have you ever seen a full-grown mustard seed plant? They're huge. They're big. And then, of course, there's great faith. And, oh, that's what we want. We long for great faith. And, and here's what happens to you. <clears throat> We long for great faith and somebody comes in in a wheelchair and lo and behold, doesn't God realize that I'm going through a period in my life where I have little faith and they want me to pray for this guy? Ever been in that kind of a situation? Come on, be honest. Somebody rolls in in a wheelchair and you're going, and here they come. And they're going, oh, they're going to ask me to pray for this person. And here's what we're, as if it's us. And they're going to expect me to raise him. And they're going to expect me to lay hands on him and he can walk. No, they're going to expect the Jesus in you to do that. That's how it works. God knows if it was, our, if it was on us, we'd be in big trouble. So what do you do? By faith, you just lay hands on him in your little faith moment and trust God to exert great faith on your behalf. But he gets the glory, amen? So continual prayer is the key to staying in communion with Jesus. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Christy's dad's going through some problems right now. She has a right to expect us to pray for her father. And that's what Jesus expects of us. And, and he's guaranteed it. When you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And you know, people say, well, I've laid hands on the sick and they died and went home to be with Jesus. That's the ultimate healing. They're totally recovered. None, none of what we experience here do they experience in heaven. So if that isn't the ultimate form of deliverance and healing, I, I don't know. I remember, some of you older folks are going to remember this. But I remember this, being raised in the Assemblies of God and in Pentecostal Church. This is our forefathers, and, and we really emphasized prayer back then, great men of prayer, used the term praying through. We need to learn to pray through. We need to pray and not quit praying until we get an answer. I, I, I've, you know, I don't always like the answer. I remember praying for a pastor's wife's father. And I was praying, man, and I was, Lord, heal him, God, deliver him, raise him up. And so help me, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, don't pray that way anymore, because I'm taking him home. I, I didn't like that. But he went home. He went home to be with Jesus. Really, it's the best thing that could have ever happened to him. But pray through until you hear something, until you get an answer. I mean, if, if we would have prayed many, many times, we bought things that we had no business buying. Come on, church. Because we didn't pray about it. It appealed to us. It was shiny. It was big. 
When I, when I used to buy cars, this is the way I bought a car. I want the biggest one you got. <clears throat> yeah. And as, and as much stuff on it as you got. <clears throat> I, I go so far back that I can remember when gas was about 18 cents a gallon. You go, boy, you are old, aren't you? <laughs> So we didn't care about gas mileage. Just want the biggest one, the brightest one, the prettiest one, and it's got the most stuff on it. And after it was two years old, was I sorry. I mean, when you've had it down to the shop and you've said, this is the 18th time that the window won't roll up. I push the button and the trunk doesn't open. Anybody been there? If we would just pray... God would say, you don't want that. She was one of the best brokers that I've ever known. She's the only broker that I've ever known other than Gilbert, but he's a good broker too. She lost a lot of business. You know why she lost a lot of business? And I bet you've done the same thing. You can't afford this house. People don't want to hear that. They walk up and, man, this, this is their dream home. They couldn't pay for it in 100 years. But there's a lot of brokers that have given place to the devil. They'll sell you anything you want. And you'll find out six months later, I wish I'd have prayed about that. I wish I'd have listened to God. I wish I'd have heard the voice of the Spirit. So praying through simply means continuing in prayer until you know the answer is on the way. And it may not always be the answer you and I want to hear, but it is the answer that's best for us. All things, all things are good for us when we're called of God. Amen? We need to persevere until God gives the answer whether seen or unseen. Often when you have prayed a matter through, circumstances will seemingly get worse, yet you know the answer is on the way. At this point, you simply lift your voice and your hands and begin to praise God, and that's one of the hardest things you will ever have to do. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would divinely heal me because I did not want to go under the knife again. How many know that I went under the knife? <laughs> I wasn't praying God's will. <clears throat> I was praying my will. It's going to hurt and I don't want to have five months of recovery and I don't want this and I don't want that. It was all about me. And God came through, as he always does, and he'll come through for you. Amen? All right. I don't have any more. <laughs>